Hello 3D printing friends! Today on the BB3D channel we're continuing our getting started with electronic series and we're going to see how to control the brightness of an LED using resistors. Stick around and we'll get into it right after this. I'm Brian and you are watching BV3D. Hi, welcome back. Hey, if you're new here and you're wanting to learn about cool 3D printer upgrades, 3D modeling and other 3D printing related stuff, Start now by subscribing and clicking the bell so you don't miss anything. Okay, so this is the second episode in the Getting Started with Electronics series in which we're using the Elegoo Super Starter Kit for Arduino Uno. The kit sells on Amazon for just under $36 US and it comes with an Elegoo Uno R3, an 830 tie point breadboard, and a whole pile of electronics components including integrated circuits, motors, sensors, and LEDs. A quick note about the Uno R3 from Elegoo. It's not Arduino branded hardware, but that's okay. The Arduino organization follows the open source hardware and software model. The source code for their software and the specifications for all their hardware are publicly available. So anybody can build an Arduino Uno, even you, and you can even do it on a regular breadboard like the one included in the kit. Arduino is focused on the community and ecosystem around their microcontroller-based products, so with more people using hardware based on their designs, more people can contribute code to projects and stuff like that, and more cool projects will exist, which will need Arduino hardware and software. That said, while the Arduino organization makes money from selling their hardware, they depend on donations as well for software development. So, if you like the whole Arduino concept and you want to support what they do, you can buy Arduino hardware directly from them, or if you have money in your charitable giving budget, consider sending a little bit of that their way, and there is a link in the description if you'd like to do that. Now, in the previous episode, we got the Arduino IDE installed, and we sent some code to the Arduino to blink its onboard LED in different ways. And blinking the LED was lesson two in the guide included in the kit. Now we're getting into lesson three, and this one is purely about electronics and not at all about code. In fact, we're not even going to use a computer for this one. We're going to be exploring LEDs and resistors, and in particular, this lesson is intended to demonstrate how you can control the brightness of an LED by using different resistor values. This project is going to be powered by the Uno R3. And when I say powered by the Uno R3, I don't mean that in the way that computers are powered by Intel or other marketing speak. What I mean is we're going to be using the 5 volt supply that's available on the Uno to power the LED. And in this series, that's how we'll do it most, if not all, of the time. We power the electronics with the voltages that are available from the Uno. So last time I recommended 3D printing the project tray that I designed with the intention that you have the Uno more or less protected from short circuits from below and kept stationary relative to the breadboard. And that way you don't have to worry about wires getting pulled out when you try to move the project from one place to another. And you can gather up all the parts for a particular project and keep them in this handy tray at the front. So speaking of parts, we're going to need a couple of jumper wires from the big bundle of them that come in the kit. I'm using one of the short red wires and one of the short black wires because those are the colors most commonly associated with power connections. And I'm also using one of the short green wires and we're going to be using that to connect the LED to the resistors. We'll also need an LED from the small bag of them. I'm using a red one, but you can use a green one or a blue one or a yellow one if you like. Just make sure you're using an LED that only has two leads coming off of it. The LEDs with four leads are the RGB LEDs, the ones with red, green, and blue LED elements all inside that one 5mm LED case. And those will be used in another episode. And we're going to need three different resistors. Resistors resist the flow of electric current, and the unit of measure for resistance is the ohm, typically denoted by the use of the Greek letter omega. So we need a 220 ohm resistor, a 1000 ohm or 1k ohm resistor, and a 10,000 ohm or 10k ohm resistor. When you unpack the bag containing all of the resistors, this will be easy because the resistors are organized by value. The resistors in each set are evenly spaced with the ends of their leads on two strips of tape, and the resistor values are stamped on one of the tape strips. Resistor values are also stamped on the resistors themselves in the form of a color code. For the longest time, resistors used a four-band color code. The first two color bands represented a two-digit number. The next color band represented a multiplier value, and the final color band represented a tolerance value, which is how accurate is this resistor. Well, the electronics industry is now able to make more accurate resistors, so the color code was expanded to five bands. 
In the five band code, the first three bands represent a three digit number. The fourth band represents the multiplier value and the fifth band represents the tolerance value. So a problem that I've run into is that the old resistors with the four band code pretty much all had a light tan shell onto which the markings were placed. And either I got used to being able to tell that red was red when it was painted on a light tan background or it's just genuinely easier to read. Resistors with the five band color code have those markings on a medium blue background and for whatever reason, that makes it really hard for me to distinguish between blue and black bands or red, orange, and brown bands. So what I tend to do when I want to identify the value of a resistor after it's been removed from the tape strips is to simply measure it with a multimeter. Got one handy right here. That tells me instantly whether it's a 100 ohm or 100k ohm resistor and I don't have to strain my eyes with bright light and a magnifying glass to try and figure that out. So there are 10 different resistor values included in the kit and they're probably the most common ones. If you want, you can organize the resistors into tiny parts bins. When you build a project, you can get the values that you need from your bins and when you take a project apart, you can measure the resistors with a multimeter and put them back in the right bin. But I digress. Where were we? Oh yes, we need a 220 ohm resistor, a 1k ohm resistor, and a 10k ohm resistor. Okay, so now that we've got all the parts we need for this lesson, I want to talk a moment about polarized and non-polarized components. In any direct current electrical or electronic circuit, you have a plus side and a minus side, positive and negative, that's polarity. And when it comes to the flow of electricity, you might think that positive means there's a surplus of the stuff and negative means there's a lack of the stuff and that it flows from the surplus to where there's a lack of it. But you would be wrong. Electricity does not flow from positive to negative. No, 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 no. Electricity flows from negative to positive. Why, you might ask? Well, because electrons are negatively charged and electrons are, conceptually, the things flowing through the circuit. They flow from an area of high concentration, the negative side, to an area of low concentration, the positive side. And if that wasn't confusing enough, the negative side of all this is also commonly referred to as ground. And you know what? Some components just absolutely do not care about which direction electricity flows. Wires, if you consider them components of a circuit, which they are, do not care. And resistors do not care. All a resistor does is resist the flow of electricity. It doesn't care which direction the electricity is flowing, it simply resists. Join the resistance! <laughs> Diodes, on the other hand, care. They're polarized. They have a positive side and a negative side. A diode is like a one-way street. Electricity can happily flow through it in one direction, but when electricity suddenly remembers that it left its wallet at home, it can't just turn around and go back the other way. Diodes just ain't having it. This is a one-way street, little electron, move along. So polarized components always have a method to determine which side of the component is positive and which side is negative. Some components have a marking on them. Electrolytic capacitors, for example, have a marking on their case with a bunch of minus signs to show you which side is negative. Regular diodes have a ring around one end. But LEDs, light emitting diodes, have to be able to emit light, so their bodies are transparent or translucent, and so there aren't any markings printed or painted on them. So here's how you tell. One of the leads is slightly longer than the other one. The longer lead is the positive one, and the shorter lead is the negative one. And if you've harvested an LED from, say, an old circuit board, and both leads were cut short, there's another way you can tell. Around the base of the LED is a little flange, and there's a flat spot on it on the side with the negative lead. So even if the leads are the same length, you can still tell which side is negative. So now you know. And knowing is half the battle. The other half is red and blue lasers, but that's a whole other show. And let's talk about this white rectangle with all the holes in it. That's the breadboard. It's called that because back in the very early days of being an electronics hobbyist, you'd actually use a board, like a flat rectangle of wood. And you'd get some wire and some wood screws, and you'd put screws in the board to act as tie points, and then you'd connect wire and electronic components to those. And since the electronic components of the time were more or less huge, this rectangle of wood was generally about the size of an actual bread cutting and serving board, hence the name. So let's take a closer look at the modern breadboard. You'll see that all these holes are in groups of five. Looking at the main part of the breadboard, there are 63 rows of holes. Each row has 10 columns arranged as two groups of five. On each row, the columns A, B, C, D, and E are connected internally. And the columns F, G, H, I, and J are connected internally. But the A, B, C, D, E group and the F, G, H, I, J group are not connected together. And the rows aren't connected to each other either. 
On each of the long edges, there are also groups of five holes in two columns. These are the power rails, and they're a little bit different. You'll notice that there's a red strip marked with a plus and a blue strip marked with a minus. All the holes along the red side of the strip are connected together, and all the holes on the blue side of the strip are connected together. But the two strips on the left side of the breadboard are not connected to the strips on the right side. Really, I think the easiest way to show you how all these are connected is to show you the back of the breadboard with the peel and stick adhesive sheet removed. Now you can see behind the scenes, or behind the adhesive, to understand. I'll show you side by side with a regular breadboard. And here's what I was talking about. Every place you see metal strips, those are potential connection points. Each one of these strips in the center section connects a group of five holes together. Along the edges, where we have the power rails, you can see that each individual column is connected along its entire length. So again, what this means is that on any given row, anything plugged into A, B, C, D, or E will be connected together, and anything plugged into F, G, H, I, or J will be connected together. But the two red strips aren't connected together, and the two blue strips aren't connected together. Okay, so now that we know a little bit about resistors and LEDs and breadboards, we can talk about schematics. A schematic, or schematic diagram, uses symbols to represent the electronic components and show how they're connected. It's like the assembly guide for the circuit. Each electronic component has a unique symbol, and these are designed, of course, for humans to look at and understand. For example, the symbol for a diode is essentially a triangle running into a wall. The triangle is an arrow pointing to this impenetrable barrier. That serves as an indicator that electricity cannot flow in that direction. Remember, diodes are polarized components. They have a positive side and a negative side. And a diode allows electricity to flow in one direction only. Earlier, I told you that electricity flowed from negative to positive. So by that logic, the wall part of the symbol is the negative side of the diode. Electricity can flow from the wall side to the arrow side, but not the other way around. The symbol for a light-emitting diode is the same symbol with the addition of a pair of arrows pointing away from it, indicating rays of light. And sometimes the arrow and wall part of the symbol is enclosed in a circle. But the rays of light are the giveaway that this is a light-emitting diode rather than a regular old diode. The symbol for a resistor is a zigzag line. The idea for us humans is, if we were traveling that path, we'd have to slow down to take all those sharp little turns. And so conceptually, we can see that this would slow down the flow of electricity. Now, remember that resistors are non-polarized components, and electricity can flow through them in either direction. They don't have a special way they need to be connected in order to do their job. Complex components, such as integrated circuits or even an entire UNO, are often represented as a simple box, with the connections appearing as lines sprouting from it similar to the legs of an actual integrated circuit. But unlike the legs of an integrated circuit, these connections shown on the schematic symbol can be in whatever order makes the most sense for the clearest, most readable diagram. So now that we've covered all that, here's the complete schematic for this lesson. We're connecting the negative side of the LED to ground. And we're connecting the positive side of the LED to plus 5 volts, but not directly. If we did that, the LED would burn out more or less instantly. We need a resistor to limit the amount of current getting to the LED. So the positive side of the LED will go to a resistor, and then the other side of the resistor will go to the plus 5 volt supply. Because using a resistor to limit the amount of electrical current flowing through an LED is such a common thing, a resistor used in this manner is nearly always referred to as a current-limiting resistor. So when you hear someone refer to a current-limiting resistor, it's not a special kind of resistor. It's just a resistor that's used to protect another component, such as an LED. Now it's time to get into the lesson. And for this lesson, we have three different resistors that we're going to use. We have the 220-ohm resistor the 1K ohm resistor, and the 10K ohm resistor. One of these resists a little bit of current, one of them resists a medium amount of current, and one of them resists a large amount of current. So on the breadboard, let's plug the red jumper wire from the 5 volt pin on the UNO to the red plus rail. And let's plug the black jumper wire from the ground pin on the UNO to the blue minus rail. Now we've got plus 5 volts and ground on this power rail. Let's plug the 220 ohm resistor into the plus 5 rail and the other side into an adjacent row. Then let's plug the 1K ohm resistor into the plus 5 volt rail and the other side into an adjacent row. And finally, plug the 10K ohm resistor into the plus 5 volt rail and again the other side 
into an adjacent row. Now, plug the shorter negative lead of the LED into the ground rail and the longer positive lead into an adjacent row. And let's power up the Uno. Plug its USB cable into your computer or into a USB power port, or as I'm doing here, you can use the 9 volt battery and the battery clip which came with the kit to power the Uno. And let's get that green jumper wire. We'll use this to easily switch between resistors. Plug one side into the same row as the longer positive lead of the LED. Where does the other side go? Well, it goes into one of the three resistors that we've got here on the breadboard. What do you think happens if we connect it to the row with the 220 ohm resistor? Is this resistor resisting a lot of current or a little? Well, let's plug it in and see. Aha! The LED has lit up and it's actually quite bright. Well now, what do you think happens if we connect it to a row with the 1K ohm resistor? Let's see. Again, the LED is lit up, but it's not as bright. Okay, last one. What do you think happens if we connect it to a row with the 10K ohm resistor? Is that one resisting a lot of current? Let's see what happens. Well, the LED is lit up again, but this time it's really not all that bright. So what can we gather from all this? Well, it seems that the more current we resist, the less we have available to power the LED and the dimmer it appears. Most of the time when using LEDs, I see recommendations to use 330 ohm resistors, and I actually have a huge roll of them. But for the purpose of this lesson, the 220 ohm resistors are able to prevent the LEDs from being damaged by too much current, and the LEDs are nice and bright. And for a lot of projects like lighting up 3D printed props or other lighting effects, you want bright LEDs. But if you're wanting to use an LED as an indicator light on a project, maybe you don't want it to be quite so bright, and in that case, you'd want to use a slightly higher resistance value. Now feel free to experiment with some of the other resistors included in the kit to see what kind of difference they make to the LED's brightness. And when you get done, put your kit away. Actually, that's more of a reminder to myself. I'm trying to keep my work area neat. Now, in the next episode in this series, we'll be doing LED stuff again, but it'll be cooler because it also involves code and color. So that'll be fun. So like I said last time, I really hope this series will inspire you to dig deeper into electronics and coding. I've been doing both for years and I really enjoy it. Well, now it's time to wrap this up. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of the video and thank you for all the likes, comments, and shares. And don't forget to subscribe and click the bell so you don't miss any cool 3D printing stuff. If you like this episode, please give it a thumbs up. If not, give it a thumbs down. But either way, please share your thoughts down in the comments. And if you like the content that I'm producing and you want to help out, check out the description for ways you can do that. Shopping using the Amazon affiliate link really helps no matter what you're buying and heck, even just subscribing is a great way to support the channel and help keep me making these videos for you. Well, now that I've got a pretty good handle on all this LED stuff, I'm going to go see what else I can make it do. You do the same and I'll see you next time.